The satirical horror movie Velvet Buzzsaw explores what happens when the pretentious world of modern art collides with a collection of supernaturally charged paintings from a dead artist with a dark and horrific past. Yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm explaining everything you need to know about Velvet Buzzsaw, the movie's ending and what each of the kills represents. Plus I'll be delving into who Vettrel Dees really is, and how his supernatural art comes to life. As you'd expect, spoilers ahead for the movie, so take care if you haven't seen it yet. When ambitious assistant Josephina stumbles across the dark, creepy art of dead painter Vettrel Dees, her decision to commercialise the work that the painter wanted to destroy kicks off a series of escalating horrific deaths. As Josephina looks at one of his portraits, the ashes of paintings that Dees was burning before he died reignite, the first indication of the supernatural forces inside his art. The eyes on this portrait also seem to move slightly from the centre to the side, looking at Josephina as she unravels and examines more paintings inside the dead artist's apartment. Those watching eyes are a spine-chilling premonition of what's to come for many of the characters in the movie. Eyes often show up shortly before a character dies, as if they're observing and making a moral judgement. Just after gallery owner Adora reveals to Josephina that she's deliberately removing many of Deese's works from the market in order to create scarcity and drive up the value, the eyes on a wall watch Bryson who's been tasked with hiding the art and who opens up a crate removing some of the paintings, presumably to keep for himself. Bryson of course ends up dead shortly after at the hands of some painted monkey mechanics. Just before Gretchen's deadly encounter with the sphere, the blurred eyes of the boy and girl in this portrait come into focus. It's as if Deesa's spirit is awakening in the painting and is about to pass deadly judgement on Gretchen for how she's abandoned the principles of her former position as a museum curator, to make money and deliberately gain special access and favours for private clients. Likewise, the eyes in a sinister doll open up to watch gallery owner John just before he's strangled by an installation in his gallery. And after Josephina ditches Damrish when he decides to go back to his art collective, there's an especially creepy eye on the graffitied wall behind her looking right at her. The mural comes alive, setting a spectacular trap for her as a gallery full of graffiti art opens up behind the wall. Josephina's death seems particularly appropriate as the paint from the art that she so despises melts, runs towards her and then consumes her, and after she's killed, we see she's been incorporated directly into the graffitied wall. What's going on with each death is that each victim ends up becoming part of the deadly artwork. Bryson was pulled into the painting of the monkey mechanics, the sphere consumed Gretchen's arm and her dead body was assumed by most people to be just another part of the art installation. Remember that the archivist who was studying Deesa's paintings discovered there was blood tissue in every one of the works she looked at. She assumed the blood belonged to Deese, and that seems quite plausible, because in one of the flashbacks there's a bowl full of blood and a bloodied knife and razor next to it, and we also see a glimpse of Deese painting with a hand partially wrapped in a bandage of sorts, and what looks like cuts or wounds around his wrists. Writer-director Dan Gilroy has talked about how one of the themes of Velvet Buzzsaw is the idea that artists invest their spirit into their art. It seems as if by literally painting his own flesh and blood into his works, Deese has invested them with a supernatural spirit. While the characters in the film are all desperately trying to take advantage of Deese's artwork and exploit his life and everything he lived through for their own gain, what they don't realise, as David Diggs, who plays Damrish, has said, is that Deese's past and the violence he lived will actually reach out and kill you. If new victims like Josephina and Bryson end up becoming part of the art which killed them, then perhaps it's also possible that some of Deese's paintings contain blood tissue from his previous victims. For example, we learn in the movie that as an adult, Deese tracked his abusive father, tortured him and burned him alive. But what if Deese painted parts of his father into some of his paintings as well? Now we need to talk about Rodora and the importance of her tattoo, Velvet Buzzsaw, which carries a lot of meaning, especially as it's also the movie's title. First of all, it's the name of the punk rock duo Rodora formed with her friend Pollyanna. Damrish tells Rodora he was a fan of their early work, but the pair eventually split up. What matters though is that Rodora abandoned her original passion and anarchic roots, and decided instead to become part of the status quo, building a career as a well-known dealer in the moneyed and powerful world of art. As she's built her status in the art, world, Rodora's learned how to trick and manipulate artists, buyers and rivals alike. She understands how to pick up promising new talent like Damrish for her gallery, while simultaneously offloading talent like Piers, who's no longer productive, onto her rival Dondon. Rodora also manoeuvres Josephina into partnering with her to sell the stolen Deese paintings, and in the past she's manipulated Morph behind his back by using his boyfriend for inside information. 
Her smarts almost seem to get her through to the end of the film unscathed, as she realises just how dangerous Deesa's paintings really are, and empties her house of any art or images. However, Deesa's spirit still finds a way to enact revenge on her for stealing his work, and the velvet buzzsaw tattoo on her neck springs to life slicing her to death, while she's in a pose which mirrors the art previously on her bedroom wall. Ultimately, as Rodora herself said, art is always dangerous, and the no death, no art tattoo on her arm is of course particularly fitting for both her and the movie. The name Velvet Buzzsaw is also an interesting oxymoron, as it implies something soft and luxurious, but sharp and deadly at the same time. It applies to Rodora and how she softly, softly manipulates people around her while also using more cutting methods to get what she wants. For example, threats of legal action to force Josefina into sharing ownership of Deesa's art. And remember that Damrish says he was specifically warned to be careful of Rodora. The name Velvet Bussell also applies to the lethal threat that a seemingly innocent piece of art can pose. Velvet Bussell is clearly a pointed critique of the contemporary art world, and the pretentious critic Morph certainly isn't spurred, as he ends up dead at the hands of Hobo Man, the walking, talking, homeless superhero that Morph was so willing to critically tear apart at the beginning of the movie. I wonder whether the inclusion of this particular artwork of a down-on-his-luck former superhero is not only a comment on the changing nature of what's popular or in when it comes to art, but also a reference to how one of the most popular genres in current film and TV entertainment, the superhero franchise, will eventually, like other genres before it, fall out of the great favour it's currently in. Gilroy also appears to think that critics can be too fast to point out faults and criticise the work an artist may have poured their heart and soul into. There's also some interesting commentary on whether too much value is given to the opinion of a critic. In the film, Rodora says Morph is a god in their world, and when he decides to publish his negative review of Hobo Man, it kills the sale of the piece that was brokered before the review ran. Morph is occasionally presented a little more positively than some of the other characters, such as when he turns down Gretchen's proposal to feed her early information about his reviews. However, he demonstrates he's more than willing to sacrifice any principles he may have if it's expedient for him to do so, or to cater to his own prejudices. For example, he gives a negative review to Ricky's art show even though he liked it, because he was sleeping with Josephina at the time and she asked him to make her ex-boyfriend Ricky suffer. And when Morph discovers Damrish is sleeping with Josephina, he yells, The admiration I had for your work has completely evaporated. He's also ridiculously fussy and snobbish, complaining about cheesy funeral music, and although he warns Rodora that Deesa's work is dangerous and that she should stop selling it and box it up and get rid of it, we see that he's kept some of it for himself and is going to lock it away in storage, presumably to sell on in the future for a huge profit. That moment is of course his ultimate undoing, because that's when he comes face to face with Hobo Man, who he disparaged so savagely at the beginning of the film. Ultimately then, the characters who die in Velvet Buzzsaw receive a death that parallels how they've behaved. Morph is literally torn apart by the thing which he figuratively tore to shreds earlier. And as the movie's producer Jennifer Fox says, Josephina is consumed by the graffiti art she rejected and Rodora by selling out her punk roots. Bryson is killed by acting on his primitive nature and Gretchen for overreaching. So why are some characters not targeted by Deesa's supernatural creations and survive to the end of the movie? It seems that Gilroy may view Coco, Damrish and Piers as relatively innocent in comparison to the others, and therefore perhaps worthy of being spurred the wrath of Deese. Coco, played by Natalia Dyer, who many of you'll know from Stranger Things, is too new to the art scene to have been completely corrupted. As an outsider who's only just joining that world, she's still clear-headed enough to understand what isn't art. For example, after Gretchen bleeds to death from having her arm sliced off by the sphere, she's the only person who can recognise that a dead body sprawled on the floor isn't actually a piece of art. As artists themselves, John Malkovich's peers and David Diggs Damrish seem to understand the underlying power of Deesa's art. Piers and Damrish both become mesmerised by Deesa's paintings, and this seems to be the trigger that leads Damrish to abandon Rodora's gallery and go back to his collective, much to Josephina's disgust. Piers also goes back to creating art purely for himself, making sand drawings that the tide gradually washes away as the credits roll. Interestingly enough, that scene was inspired by Dan Gilroy's own experiences in the 1990s writing the movie Superman Lives, starring Nick Cage and directed by Tim Burton. When he found out the movie was being canned after 18 months of hard work, Gilroy told EW that he went down to the beach and thought about how nothing he wrote was ever going to be seen, and so he might as well come down and write words in the 
sand and have the waves just wash them away. But that was also the day that Gilroy decided to value what he creates not for how many people see it or its commercial success, but simply for himself. However you feel about the movie, Velvet Buzzsaw is more than just a horror film set in the contemporary art world. It's also a commentary about our relationship with any art form, including movies and TV. Velvet Buzzsaw's producer Fox has said it's about the commodification of art and the way in which this self-selecting group of curators and dealers is anointing certain people, ignoring other people and creating a false economy. Gilroy has also said that art can't really exist without somebody paying for it, but once art becomes monetized, it loses something. And the problem when you over monetize art is that it becomes an object rather than something imbued with a spirit, an idea or even a soul. Which is why there's that line in the movie where Josephina says, what's the point of art if nobody sees it? The film itself suggests that it's only the artists who realise the true value of art as both Damrish and Piers reject the over-commoditised art scene and return to their artistic roots. This whole idea of the point of art and who sees it is also interesting because although Velvet Buzzsaw premiered at the Utah-based indie film festival Sundance, the movie is available on the global streaming service Netflix, which means a lot more people will likely see this film than if it were released only in cinemas. As for writer-director Dan Gilroy, he has various ambitions for the film. Obviously, he wants people to see and enjoy the movie, but he also wants it to spark conversations and ideas. On top of that, he told Vanity Fair that he hopes people look at art in a slightly different way, and that they realise the artists behind it have invested their creative soul into the work. And finally, he'd like the movie to do for the art world what Jaws did for swimming. In other words, when walking into a gallery of art, one should fear what might happen. After all, what about all those Deese paintings that have found their way into the hands of street vendors selling them for five bucks a piece? Will Deese be okay with this as the works are in the hands of the people now rather than in the privileged art scene? Or will he move on from taking revenge on the hypocritical art world to judging the everyday hypocrisy of ordinary people? So what do you think of Velvet Buzzsaw and what did you take away from the movie? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're new here and enjoyed this, then every week I have new movie breakdowns, so do subscribe and hit the bell to get all my new videos. Until then, you can tap left for my latest horror movie video or tap right for another video you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Yippee ki movie lovers!